So let's talk a little bit about hilts. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Daily Tory. So here I've got the Todd Stuff Langmesser again. And obviously the subject of hilts is an enormous subject. Um, and I could literally spend probably, I would, this, I might have to do this as a challenge. I think I could probably talk about hilts for an entire day. But let's just pick on one particular topic. And that is the overall size and weight of hilts okay now this is actually a it seems like it that seems like a very broad topic in itself but I, i'm specifically talking about one thing so when we look at a weapon like this if we're talking about it in comparison to example so a, a fundamentally similar in the grand scheme of things weapon if we compare it to a cutlass okay if we note the differences between a langmesser and a cutlass well this specific example the cutlass has a narrower blade they're about the same length. The cutlass is a little bit longer, but let's not worry about that. Um, they've got different shaped points, um, and the cutlass is narrower. Um, in terms of distal taper and thickness, they're about the same. Actually, the, um, the cutlass actually has better, what I would describe as better distal taper, this being an antique, this being a reproduction. Um, I would say that this Langmesser could be made better with more distal taper. In actual fact, it would handle more nicely and probably perform, probably cut better as well. Um, but, um, you know, reproductions often don't have the degree of distal taper that antiques do. So let's set that aside. Okay, but generally speaking, they are similar-ish blades in that they will have similar, in the grand scheme of things, similar cutting performance, similar thrusting performance, and they're a similar size and weight. But if we really talk about the difference between the two weapons as units, as things, Overall, the obvious elephant in the room is the hilt, isn't it? Okay, so the, the big advantage that the cutlass has got over the Langmesser is the hilt. Much, much more protective hilt. Now, um, in the 15th century, uh, the, so just to have a look at the hilt, what does the hilt offer in terms of protection? Well, a very short cross guard or cuillance, cuillance um, and a nagel or nail which sticks out sideways. This nagel or nail, as I've mentioned before, is particular to uh, to the Langmesser is a particular feature. Not all Langmessers have it, although most do, and it's usually classed as a defining feature of the Messer, of the Langmesser. Falchions do not generally have that sidebar, um, although there are types of hanger, as I would call them, that particularly in England and the Low Countries, which actually have an entire bar sticking off the side there, which obviously offers more protection. Some Langmessers, uh, particularly later period ones in the 16th century, and falchions, in fact, um, have a knuckle bow. So I don't own one of those, but if I just grab my um, 18th century, so this is probably mid, mid 18th, maybe mid to late 18th century uh, naval hanger, um, this is a full knuckle bow, but funnily enough, we do start to see knuckle bows not dissimilar from that as early as the 15th century, and they really become fairly common actually in the 16th century, um, by, by, by the middle of the 16th century. Um, but they appear first in the 15th century. So knuckle bows, complex guards, we could say knuckle bows are the beginning of complex guards, especially the nagel as well, really actually begin in, in, the, in, the, um, in the 15th century, earlier than most people assume, but they became common in the 16th. So you don't have an awful lot of protection with the standard Langmesser, but there are types that already started to develop more bars and more protection. If we look at 16th century Langmessers, we sometimes see the nagel uh, replaced by a shell um, so essentially a giant sized nagel or a ring, a side ring, okay? And very often the side ring might be coupled with another side ring on the other side, not always because that makes it a nuisance to wear. Um, and also if you look at the hand, most of the meat of the hand is on one side of the weapon. So the ring on this side is much more useful than on this side, generally speaking. Uh, but sometimes you get an extension on this side to protect the thumb as well. Um, knuckle bows and sometimes side a side bow that essentially connects to the knuckle bow and you end up moving towards what's if I just grab over here moving towards a a basket hilt ultimately uh, I mean that's the kind of you know things like swept hilts on rapiers and basket hilts are the uh, kind of full uh, end product I suppose of, of that line of development and uh, well I suppose what you could say the end product actually is the full um, shell hilt or half basket hilt as it's sometimes known. That is what most of you would recognize as a cutlass or a sabre hilt. Um, now, 
There is another element, and this is really the point that I'm working around to, there is another element to consider with hand protection. And that is, whenever you add things to the back end of the weapon, it adds mass. Now, that's a complicated topic because the overall weight of many, many types of sword, be it hangers or sabres or long swords or arming swords or back swords or whatever, actually come within quite a narrow weight range. They tend to vary between about 800 grams and about, let's say, 1800 grams. Okay? The majority of medium-sized um, swords, so not talking about Zwei handers, not talking about knives, but everything in the middle, tends to vary between those two weights. If we look at something like a spadroon, a spadroon might sometimes be as light as seven or eight hundred grams, sometimes even less. Small swords can be really light, but let's ignore small swords because they're a bit, they're so specialized they're a bit of an outlier. We're just talking about cut and thrust swords here. Um, so spadroons perhaps at the lightest end of the spectrum. Lots of um, sabers are also at the lighter end of the spectrum, 800 to 900 grams very often. Um, cavalry sabers like these you can be as light as 800 grams or as heavy as about 1,000 grams. Um, and then, notice I'm using metric here. <laughs> I actually think for this, metric works a bit better. Um, and, um, you know, lots of things like uh, lang messers and arming swords, type 10, you know, Viking period swords, uh, things like that, and rapiers indeed, um, are usually above or very often above a thousand grams, okay? Um, they can be lighter, you do find certainly messes that are quite light, that are more like sabre weight, that are like 800 grams, but a lot of medieval and renaissance swords, side swords and such like, are let's say 900 grams up to about 1300 grams. And then larger weapons like long swords and really big military rapiers and stuff can sometimes be above 1500 grams. So relatively narrow margins and as soon as you start adding anything onto the hilt end of the weapon it drastically changes that total weight. Now why is that a bad thing? Well first of all the total weight of the weapon you have to carry it around all. In the purest sense it makes it heavier, okay? It makes the weapon weigh more. If the weapon weighs more it means it's more of a nuisance to carry around and together with its scabbard it becomes a heavier object. That's number one. Number two issue is that it becomes heavier to use, very obviously. I'm stating the blindingly obvious here, but I think it's important to list the points out. Now, if it's heavier to use, what exactly does that mean? Well, actually, making a heavier hilt has some quite profound physical um, changes and characteristics that it makes to the way that the weapon performs. If, for example, um, I take this blade and cut with it, okay, I am, most of the inertia in the blade is, is up here, okay, and um, that translates to a lot of energy going to the target. Having the mass in more in the, 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 the pointy end of the blade, should we say, or the, the, the kind of the um, action end of the blade, the end of the blade that we're doing the most things to the opponent with, yes, we can pummel them, but let's end them rightly, but let's put that aside for a minute. Um, having the inertia up here translates to a lot of energy into the target, okay? Um, and clearly that's a good thing if we're looking at cutting power. Ignore thrusting for now, let's just talk about hitting. Um, therefore, if we add a lot of mass to the back end of the weapon, what we're doing is we're, we're slowing the entire weapon down because we're making it heavier and more sluggish to move. Often it will mean if we don't change the blade at all, we're bringing the point of balance back, which brings the centre of percussion back, usually, um, without, if we don't change the blade another, any other way. And essentially we're making the end of the weapon slightly less effective. Okay? Now this is detailed in far more detail than I'm intending to do in this video. This is detailed in a book called A Memoir on Swords by Colonel Mary. His actual full name was Colonel Mary Mong, um, but he was a celebrated French cavalry commander who um, campaigned in North Africa, I believe Tunisia and Algeria, maybe Morocco, um, in the 19th century, uh, kind of, I think, around the 1830s and 40s. Um, and he wrote a book in French um, called uh, Memoir on Swords, whatever the French is for that, or Memoir de, des Epées, or something like that. Um, and um, amazingly, this was translated into English by a British officer who uh, was serving in India at the time. And then that British officer was... Um, <laughs> um, his belongings were all looted during the Indian Mutiny 
Um, but amazingly, this book survived, and he, I think it was found, it was retrieved from like a ditch in a street or something. So it was an amazing survival of, of a treatise. But anyway, you can buy this book online if you just search for it. In fact, it's free online. I think it's on Google Books now. But anyway, if you Google a memoir on swords, Colonel Mary, that's M A R E Y, uh, then you should find it. And it's linked from the Scholar Forum database as well. Um, Anyway, and he talks in length about this and about the mass on hilts and also about the distribution of the mass on those hilts. So an important point to add is, yes, we can add more hand protection and ultimately end up with a cutlass of, of sorts or a hanger with a developed hilt. But that, whilst that gives you a huge amount more hand protection, it does, we must recognise, detract, detract from the effectiveness of the blade, assuming we don't change the blade in any ways to, to counter to counter that effect. What's interesting is that if we add mass to the hilt and that makes the tip of our weapon less effective at chopping, um, one of the ways to counter that is to then add more mass to the tip of the weapon again. And what does that do? What does that, if we actually think about that for a minute, it means we're adding more mass to the hilt and then more mass to the blade. So we're making an even heavier weapon. So, you know, if we look at um, something like a Turkish uh, kilit, kilic, 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 I never know how to say that, kilic, um, and if we look at something like a, you know, various, even tulwars, for example, we notice that very often the concentration of, of mass of material is actually in the hitting end of the blade, and that's for that reason, it's to make it as effective as possible, and they had light hilts partly, whether they knew that or not, whether it was just trial and error, we don't know, but they had light hilts, which actually keeps all of that effectiveness in the end of the blade. So, to sum up without wittering for too long, I know that I do talk a long time anyway, uh, but quite simply, I often talk about strengths and weaknesses of swords based on hand protection, and that's partly because I'm a sabre. I love sabres, I love cutlasses, I love these developed hilt, hilt weapons, because I'm a Fencer. I fight, you know, I fight with various weapons. I also do sword and shield, long sword, arming sword, um, even a little bit of Langmesser occasionally, uh, on Dussac as well. Um, and quite frankly, when you're fighting with these things, hand protection is a massive fucking advantage, okay? Um, unless you're fighting in melees, in melees you don't notice the hand protection isn't required so much. Uh, if you're using shields, you don't need it so much. If Obviously, if you're fighting in armour and you have gauntlets, you don't need hand protection at all, really. Well, cross guard's quite good, but you don't need much more than that. Um, so there are lots of contexts in which uh, the hand protection is not so important. But if we're talking about an unarmoured person fighting an unarmoured person with equal weapons one on one, hand protection is a big thing. Um, is really really valuable. So I often mention hand protection. But to um, to mitigate that, I am completely willing to accept that by making a hilt lighter it means that you can keep a blade lighter and still be extremely effective and vicious with the power of your cut. So there are some virtues to keeping a hilt as light as possible and it has to be said that one of the ways of keeping a hilt light is to minimise the hand protection. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.